Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Thursday, April 28, 2011, and our special guest today is Dale Stevens, who's going to talk about UnCollege, a social movement supporting self-directed higher education. Dale, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for, thank you for having me, Steve. Uh, you're most welcome, and you're obviously adept at the microphone thing, and I'm greatly appreciative of that. And if you wouldn't mind turning it off again, I'll have you turn it back on once you come back. The Future of Education is an interview series on the education in the age of the Internet, but it's really fun how this has become such a rich and diverse conversation. Um, on May 10th, we're going to have a panel on passion-based education, and actually there is a panel tomorrow, no, tomorrow, Saturday, on passion-based education as well, and if somebody would put that in the chat, I forgot to put it on the notes here as part of a conference in Arizona. Then on May 11th, Hugh McGuire rescheduled for his discussion on LibriVox. If you don't know LibriVox.org, a terrific crowdsourced audio recording service um, for public domain uh, literature, just a terrific site and really fun to talk to him about books and the future of books and reading. Paul Kimmelman then talks about the school leadership triangle, Mark Fensky on the winner's brain, Chris on the art of nonconformity, that's going to be really fun. Um, you can see Sir Ken Robinson's back on May 25th, uh, second time on the show, Jim Bosco on participatory learning. Uh, what else is new? Our unschooling panel has been rescheduled, uh, and Lisa's in the audience here, and she's going to be coming on. That's June 1st. Um, I don't know if there's any. Oh, Kieran Egan is new. That's July 26th. His book is called Learning in Depth. Uh, he's been on the show before, and his new book actually ties in a little bit to. Uh, to what we're going to talk about today. And you can see, oh, and uh, Richard and Rebecca Dufour, I've misspelled their name, I think it's D-U-F-O-U-R, uh, on learning communities and education coming up in August. So lots of fun. Hope there's something on that schedule that you're interested in. If you've missed any of our shows, they are recorded, and they are up in both full Illuminate recordings and in MP3 versions. Uh, yesterday, a really brilliant session uh, by Iris Sokol and Pam Moran. If you missed that, um, really worth listening to. Uh, a discussion of moving toward a community-based learning, a community-built learning, um, really worthwhile. Not not a very large audience. It was a Colorado tie event, and I don't think they got the attendance they wanted, but the content was brilliant. Before that, Barry Schwartz from Swarthmore College on his books, um, The Paradox of Choice and Practical Wisdom, <laughs> really deep, interesting books. David Shank on the, I have to call it brilliant, uh, uh, book, The Genius Within All of Us, but obviously lots, lots more, uh, and, and hopefully there's something there that's worth your while. If this is your first time in Illuminate, I would suggest you go up to View Layouts and switch to the Wide Layout. It makes it much easier to see the chat. Uh, this is a participative environment. You'll see you have lots of ways to indicate uh, how you're feeling about things uh, in the chat, or you can use the little emoticons that are at the bottom of the participant window. You see a smiley face, a clapping hand, a confused look, or a thumbs down. Those are ways you can express yourself in addition to the text in the chat. You can also use that icon. It's the hand with the green up arrow, a little bit larger icon, to raise your hand when we go to Q&A. And you can grab the microphone and ask a question, or you can ask questions in the chat. Yes, the wide layout is much better. Um, and we're going to give you your first chance now to participate. Look for the wand. It's the wand with the red star at the end, or the, what they call a laser pointer, but it looks more like a wand to me. Click on that, and then click on the map. It lets us know where you're participating from. Fun to hear shout-outs in the chat as well. Uh, New Zealand, China, United States, Canada. There's been some pretty serious weather in the U.S. this week. If you've been involved in that, we have been thinking about you. Looks like Australia as well. How fun. If that's two in China, that's really fun. Somebody taking a trip along the east coast of the United States there. As always, we really appreciate your being here, wherever you're listening from. Or if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much for spending the time. We hope it's worth your while. 
So Dale, you can turn your mic back on. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. This is really fun. Um, you're going to find that um, you probably are holding some interviews where people are sort of stunned and shocked at your radical ideas. I think you're going to find that this particular audience uh, maybe is a little bit like preaching to the choir. But um, this really is a fun opportunity, I think, to kind of drill down with you on your background, on the ideas behind homeschooling and unschooling, and then look at your uncollege project uh, in some depth. So if it's okay with you, I'd love to start with sort of a discussion of homeschooling and unschooling. And could you tell us what's the difference between homeschooling and unschooling? In my mind, the difference between homeschooling and unschooling is that as an unschooler, I directed my own education. I didn't prescribe to a set curriculum, nor did I allow my parents or any other authority to dictate what I was going to learn. I took the initiative to go out and leverage the educational resources that were in the world to create my own learning environment. So, do you know Jim Bach? Does that name ring a bell with you? It sounds familiar, but I could been on the show. He, he wrote a book on um, sort of his his unschooling life, and in his circumstance, you know, his parents kind of uh, pushed him or allowed him to go out of the house and sort of self-directed his own learning. Are you comfortable telling us your parents' role here and and how much did they participate in supporting this or encouraging it? I came to my parents at the end of fifth grade and said that I had not learned anything and that another means of education was necessary if I were to continue to learn. And at the time, the only experience that we've had with, with homeschoolers was with individuals who were homeschooling in a, a very traditional manner, really doing school school at the home. Um, and then I found a, a, a ad in the local newspaper for a not back to school night hosted by some local unschoolers in the neighboring town, Davis, and convinced my parents to go, which was admittedly a bit of a challenge. My mom had been a public school teacher and my dad had gone all the way through uh, traditional education through college. Um, and you know, had, had conformist backgrounds, if you will. And I think what they were particularly worried about was that homeschooling would be isolating. But what we came to realize that night was that unschooling actually provided me the opportunity to uh, engage with other individuals. There are about 20 or so making up an, an unschooling class, and we took turns uh, teaching classes with each other. We had cooperative classes that rotated between people's houses. And it really, in fact, provided uh, uh, it wasn't just an alternative, but it was actually a better educational solution uh, to what I've experienced in the public schools. Well, then you talk about how you feel that uh, you maybe even worked harder than your friends who were in public school. And, and we have one daughter who went through a, a sort of a traditional homeschool experience. Uh, it was maybe partly homeschool, partly unschooling, but she studied the great books. And I would have said the same thing, that she worked harder. Um, there are studies on achievement for homeschoolers uh, that you quote, but do they actually mention unschooling and is there any differentiation in those studies between homeschooling and unschooling? The, there's none that I'm aware of and I think that's simply because there isn't I, a, a large enough sample size or b, uh, unschooling isn't actually recognized as a, as a separate pedagogy from unschooling. I think that unschooling is uh, most generally lumped in with uh, with all of them with, with all of homeschooling. In fact, when I'm explaining what uncollege is to someone who's not familiar with alternative pedagogies, I'm, I usually say that unschooling is a form of homeschooling, where the learner directs their own education. So the other thing that I'd like to know. Go ahead. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that. Yes, there is correlation between, say, academic achievement, but that's, it's still hard to measure because those metrics are still taken on uh, a standardized scale. So, you know, you can say that homeschoolers perform, perform better on the SAT, et cetera, et cetera, which may be empirically true, but it's important to know that those come with it a bias and 
you know, while it's, it's valid information that can tell you something specific about how the two groups interact uh, with a specific metric, um, it's not necessarily indicative of the groups as a whole. It does seem that, that measuring is a conundrum here. Do we use the existing measures, diplomas, accreditation, degrees? Um, it feels like when we don't use those, we're a little bit unmoored, and we don't we don't really have anything else. How do you define success? How did you, and how do you, and and how do others that you've associated with in unschooling define success? I personally define success in terms of the impact that I have on other people. And I think the advantage of defining success for yourself is that it makes success more achievable. If you think of success in purely economic terms, it's always going to be relative and it's always going to be increasing. And inherently, you set yourself up for disappointment. In Western society, we function in this paradigm where we think that we have to do something to have things to be happy. And if instead we could function in a more Eastern paradigm and start with by being happy, then we do things that are productive and most likely lucrative that would allow us to have any material goods that we wish. Both of those solutions arrive at the same outcome, wild success, but in one instance, you're invisible, and in the other instance, you're enjoying the ride. And it seems, you know, I, I think it's terribly unfortunate that particularly Americans, have come to define success in such narrow economic terms. And, I, and that, that narrow definition of success only helps to perpetuate uh, the, the bubble of higher education because academic inflation isn't just increasing because jobs are, are uh, requiring that people have more advanced degrees, but rather because people think that they need to have more advanced degrees to succeed. Uh, there's a philosopher at Stanford who named Rene Girard who has a theory called mimetic desire and hypothesizes that all human desire comes from imitation. We only want something because somebody else has it. And I think that's perfectly true with the college degree. We only want something because everybody else has it. And, you know, we're at that point where, you know, if, if a college degree is the new high school degree, then, you know, in 10 years, will that be masters and PhDs? And as we asymptotically approach this point at which everybody has a PhD, we can't just tell everybody to go get out and go out and get two. Yet, in fact, some people are already doing that. And there was a, a report in the Chronicle of Higher Ed that came out last fall that said that there was something like 17,000 janitors in the U.S. Uh, who had doctorate degrees. And I think that's, you know, wholly indicative that of A, that too many people are going to college, and B, the value of the college degree is plummeting while the cost is skyrocketing. So I'm going to offer a little bit of a counterproposal here, uh, and, and I'm interested in kind of your take on it. It, it feels to me like you've tapped into a um, uh, a thought pattern or a, or a, um, a body of thought that's, that is um, that has existed for a long time, sort of in the shadow of traditional educational philosophy. So we had um, Sudbury schools and Summerhill and Big Picture and uh, John Taylor Gatto and. John Holt and progressive education, sort of a variety of people who have sort of criticized the existing system. Is there something about our day right now which is going to allow this to flower more than it has been able to in the past? Absolutely, and, and that's because the, the beauty of the internet is that we can suddenly dynamically show what we've done instead of just statically tell it on a resume. And because we have the power to show evidence of what we've done, people can succeed without a college degree, without having to submit to the system. And in fact, one of the main parts of Uncollege is that we're working on building a platform called RadMatter to allow people to 
recognize and demonstrate their talent in an online portfolio. And we've seen the rise of things like Clout or GitHub and Stack Overflow that provide these specific metrics for a specific skill set and allow individuals to demonstrate what they've done in a specific area. You know, with Stack Overflow, you can host online repositories of your code and are then given a socially validated metric in correspondence to the quality of that code, the input of the other users, uh, contributions to the community, et cetera, et cetera. And what we want to do w with Red Matter is expand that, that, that niche model to the entire market to, make, to, to allow people to demonstrate life-wide learning in an, an online portfolio and ultimately connect them with opportunities like jobs so that they can succeed without, without a degree. So there are uh, a number of organizations kind of around democratic schooling or alternative schooling ideas. Um, have they reached out to you or have you reached out to them and, and made any good connections? Which institutions are, are you thinking of in specific? Well, so like um, AERO, I'm not sure what that stands for. It's uh, Education Revolution. Alternative, right. Um, I, and I will be speaking at the at the Aero Conference in Portland in August, that is. Um, but I'm at such an early stage that I, I, I haven't gone out and actively uh, talked to any of those specific or organizations. And partly that's because I've been overwhelmed by the response. But I think it's also partly because there's been, there's been a huge push to democratize education. The content, the content is available. That's not where the problem is. You know, we've seen things like the rise of P2PU, Academic Earth, Sophia, MIT Open Courseware, Udemy, the Khan Academy. The content is there. But there's not a way to aggregate that content and combine it with everything that you've done, both offline, online, job experiences, internships, travel, service, folding the laundry to demonstrate that you've gained talent in, in non-traditional ways. So we had David Wiley on the show, and I think he was actually one of the original, um, I don't know, it wasn't P2PU, but it was one of the other ones. I think it was um, OER University, maybe. Someone in the, in the audience will know. But he talks about um, MIT OpenCourseWare, and I think by extrapolation, you know, Khan Academy, as being still very one web 1.0. Uh, that they're about scaling the availability of content, but not about users actually creating the content for the learning of others. So you've talked about being able to represent what you've done, but um, have you thought about how users could teach each other, and is that a part of what you're thinking of? We're, we're not thinking of, of attacking that problem either, because it's, it's an entirely different beast, and there are, in fact, startups out there who are working on solving that problem. Um, a great one is, is Skillshare, which is based in New York right now. But I mean, there are others, of course, like P2PU with John Britton, um, School of Everything, uh, Super Cool School, that are allowing the internet to create open source content, basically, and allowing users to interact with each other. So I don't think that's where the problem is either. And you know, because of that, we've, we've decided to, to focus the issue and try to solve the solution of, of aggregating all that learning that happens everywhere and be able to demonstrate into, demonstrate it in a single digital portfolio. Um, I wonder if you've talked to Sailor. I think they're S-A-Y-L-O-R. I think there, there might be an interesting connection for you there. Um, so, do you have siblings? I'm an only child. Okay, so uh, sort of post all of this, how have your parents responded? Um, are they, uh, were they, did they, were, did they show support early on after you kind of made this move? Did it take some amount of time? Do you feel like they're supportive now? My parents are, are terribly supportive and are absolutely wonderful people. And I have to thank them for including me as part of the decision-making process, even from a very young age. And 
because of that inclusion, I always felt that I was empowered to make my own decisions. And while that's perhaps uh, put me in sticky situations at some point, um, some point, it gave me the courage to believe in myself enough to take my education beyond the classroom and, and declaratively say that I can succeed without subscribing to the institution. My, my dad has been uh, slightly more reserved in, uh, in his support than my mom, but he is um, a conformist in different ways. And we're both very non-traditional but we express it in, in completely different fashions. Um, my dad's the sort of person who, whenever we go out hiking, which we did a lot when I was young, would never follow the traditional path. He would always pull out his topo map and find a cross-country route that, that, that led more directly to the destination. And in the same way, I'm charting my own path to get to the destination quicker, except that I don't think there is a destination, and that path is life for me. Do you think we have some kind of dysfunctional psychological relationship with traditional schooling, almost like um, maybe codependent, that, um, that we end up loving it even though it was bad for us because we went through it? Um, and, and if that's the case, do we have a generation who are going to have a very hard time understanding uh, this freedom? I wouldn't say that we have uh, a difficult psychological relationship with school at this point, at least among the masses, but that's only because the m most individuals haven't taken the time to think about and realize that there might actually be another option. Among individuals that I've talked to at colleges and universities around the country who've sent me emails over the last three months, I've been surprised at the remarkable continuity in that and recognition that there's a difference between college and life. And whether this is a dichotomy that we've artificially imposed or whether it really exists doesn't matter. What matters is that pe people perceive that it's there. And that perception contributes to the fact that college graduates are, are, are floundering. I, mean, I don't think that, that college or even school is preparing people to direct their own lives. And if instead we could allow people to learn from life instead of confining them to academic institutions, we could prepare them to direct their own lives when they finish. And also, unleash human potential. So that sounds a lot like the description of a liberal arts education when I was going to school. Um, do you feel that, uh, that maybe we've lost a little bit of that? I think that, that the liberal arts has moved away from uh, its definition in the traditional sense. And in fact, I chose a liberal arts college because at the time that I was applying to schools, I believed that the value of small personal relationships and a close-knit community was what I needed. And I thought that I would flounder at a large institution. But what I found at college was that there were bright people with good ideas, but who only knew how to pursue them in an academic context who didn't know how to take them and apply them in the world. And there's certainly knowledge to be gained at liberal arts colleges. I certainly learned things at Hendricks. But I didn't gain any practical knowledge about how I could set, set, set a course to change the world. So tell us a little bit about what you did. I know that you spent some time in France, that you started a photo business, that you worked at Zinch. 
Is, can you give us a little bit of the history there? Unschooling allowed me to pursue many possibilities that would not have availed themselves had I not been, been free of the institution. I started a flower delivery business, which then branched into a photo business, Creekside Cards and Photos. Uh, and then that actually led into me uh, being the official campaign photographer for Go Gavin Newsom's uh, failed gubernatorial campaign, but he's now lieutenant governor, so that worked out in the end. Um, at the same time, I was able to live in France and, uh, in fact, had a French exchange student live with us for six months, and I returned to live with him for six months. The biggest takeaway from living in France was not that I learned a new language or experienced a new culture. But in fact, that I learned how to look at the world through a different paradigm. I could suddenly introspect my own culture, nation, identity, language, experience from a different perspective. And that made me more cognizant of uh, the global environment that we live in. When I returned from France, I completed my 11th grade experience. I still have not found a great way to, uh, to express grades in unschooling aside from relating it to traditional school. And started my college application process and always presumed that the college degree was uh, the next step to adulthood. I went through the college application process, applied to schools, decided where I was going to go, and after that was finished, decided that I needed something to do with the last half of my senior year. I guess my version of senioritis was going to get myself a job at Zinch, a startup in San Francisco. And in San Francisco, I found and connected with an ideal community of bright, young, passionate, motivated individuals who, above all, knew how to take ideas and execute them. And it wasn't really until I got to Hendricks for orientation week that I started questioning my decision at all. And in fact, the, the founder of Zinch, McKagan, had been encouraging me to not go to college and to stay and, and work at Zinch, which is slightly ironic given that uh, Zinch's business is to help students get into college. And the last week before I went to college, I spent, I, I hired my replacement who had just graduated from Harvard Business School. And it wasn't until I got to Arkansas that it really hit me that there I was, 18, had just spent the week training somebody who graduated from HBS and realized that maybe in fact I didn't need college. But my reasoning was that I gave it a try which I did, and uh, found out that it wasn't for me. And I'm now back in San Francisco and uh, working in the startup world once again. So R. Wolcott so R. is R. not R. drinking R. the Kool-Aid. He says, I do not think I want my doctor to be on school. How do you respond to those kinds of comments? I think that there are certainly types of licensed professions where it makes sense to have a standard curriculum and a standard set of metrics. And I would say that the medical profession is, is one of those. But at the same time, a doctoral program, I think, is more unschooly than you might expect. You know, it involves residencies. It involves actual real-world hands-on experience yeah, in what you're going to be doing. So I would argue that getting, getting an MD is part of the unschooling process, particularly because people don't just get MDs for the heck of it. People usually get MDs because they want to be doctors. And I'm an advocate of people learning in whatever way is best for them, but also in learning in whatever way is best for what they want to pursue. And if that happens to be in the classroom, so be it. Jackie wants to know the role of higher ed and education. 
and uh, I'm interested in what you think the standard arguments for college are, and and how do they really map out in reality? So, the standard arguments for, I mean, people think that you should go to college for mainly three reasons. To signal to society that you've achieved a certain status, to prove your competency in a certain subject, and to mature. But today, you can signal, well, you can't signal yet, I'll get there. Um, you know, you, you, you can prove your competency in non-traditional ways, and, and that's the beauty of the Internet and what we want to help aid with Rad Matter. We want Rad Matter to become an experience clearinghouse that has that name, that serves as a signal to society. But ultimately, if you can achieve the same outcomes as someone who's followed a traditional path in a non-traditional way, that's far more impressive than putting one foot in front of the other. If you can instead bound to the forefront and, and zigzag up the course, that's going to make a far more compelling story and uh, be much more convincing that you have what it takes to succeed. The last argument about maturity is, I think, something that is, is, is definitely valid. But I don't think that college is serving that purpose. Going to college maturity level wise felt like a regression for me. Suddenly there were individuals who were cleaning my bathrooms in the dorm, who were cooking my meals, taking care of life's little necessities, and further contributing to that dichotomy between college and life. And the arguments that I heard amongst my fellow students at Hendricks were that, you know, at college you can stay up all night and party and get drunk and all these things that you supposedly can't do in life. And my argument is, well, of course you can. You can stay up all night anytime you want. You can party whenever you want. That's not something that's restricted to college. But the way college has become stereotyped in our society's mind's eye is as a place where inhibitions are let loose uh, in order to help people develop. And that somehow by the end of four years of a supposedly nurturing environment that I think is in fact allowing people free reign without many if any consequences, uh, is a bit ludicrous. Okay, so let's move on to uncollege. So, uh, what's the core idea? The core idea is that it's okay to be different. You can succeed in non-traditional manners. And most people have perhaps never been told that it's okay to do something different and that it's, in fact, perhaps a better idea to prove yourself in a non-traditional manner. Ultimately, what we want to do is validate and motivate self-directed higher education. The validation piece is why we're building Rad Matter, but the motivation piece is going to take the form of a book that I'm writing about the process of learning from life and creating your own higher education. But we're also working on organizing uh, an uncollege tour to colleges and universities around the country, as well as uh, working with existing colleges and universities to bring about systemic change by developing experiential learning programs to help students take those faltering steps out from behind the desk and into the world. You know, we can, we can talk all day about how software as higher education is great and receive affirmation. But if we want to reach, reach the fringes and not the masses, 
we have to be able to interface with students who've come from a structured learning background. And people ask me, well, don't you think everybody should drop out of school? And the answer to that is no, I don't. For, for individuals who have come from a structured learning background, who've never had another option, telling them to, to stop out of school is probably a bad idea. Uh, learning for life, learning from, from life takes a certain skill set. And it's a skill set that's, that's developed through the process. It's not something that you can just jump into and gain all at once. So, a, a, a so college tour. A college tour. Uh, what is RAD matter? How do you spell it? R A D M A T T E R. RAD matter is the platform that I'm building to validate lifelong learning. We want to allow people to demonstrate and recognize their talent in a digital portfolio in such a way that they can turn life wide learning experiences into opportunities. So it seems like this is a little uh, connected to Zinch. Um, is it kind of a comparable thought process or idea? Actually, I've never connected it to Zinch. Um, but I suppose that it is in, in, in some vein. Uh, you know, Zinch is about connecting students to opportunities. But I suppose that I want to take that to the next level. And, in fact, I, I sort of had this, this idea about building a, a site to allow people to demonstrate their talents uh, back in mid-February and was talking to a contact at the Gates Foundation. And the Gates Foundation connected me with a team in New York who had, in fact, been developing this idea for uh, a much longer time and had worked in uh, game mechanics to, to incent people to maximize their human potential. Um, and now we've been working together uh, on, on defining the vision for Rad Matter, and are working on, on building a minimum viable product uh, for about the last month and a half. So could you make the argument that, that, um, that, uh, that it's so easy right now to get a Weebly account or one of these other sort of website building services that providing a service for people to um, to map their accomplishments isn't actually as valuable as it would be for them to build their own website around their own domain name and to create uh, their kind of own um, self-determined, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a uh, you know, website or portfolio. personal uh, portfolio. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously more than that, but their online presence. Oh, certainly, and, and, and I mean, that's what I did. But the fact is that many people don't have those technical skills. And I don't think that we should let uh, technical ability stand in the way of other people's talents. You know, someone may be a great communicator, but, you know, may not know what ICANN or GoDaddy or hosting or HTML is. And that, that shouldn't be a de determining factor. Okay, I like that. So, um, so uh, are you getting any funding from the Start Some Good? And uh, I, mean, I kind of know the answer to that. It doesn't seem like it's much. Were you expecting more, or how do you think that you'll you'll get funding and financing? So, I, I started the, the Start Some Good account back in February when I didn't know about uh, a number of possibilities for financing that have uh, since availed themselves. Um, and I haven't been actively promoting it because uh, I'm, I'm waiting on those other funding sources uh, before uh, seeking, seeking other funds. I don't, you know, I, I don't need to go looking for funds in multiple places if, if I have them secured in one place. Um, but hopefully in about the next two weeks, uh, we should be securing some funding. Um, and we'll be able to tell you more about that soon. So over the, uh, I, I took a spring break last week with my family, and uh, two things happened. One was I was kind of watching the three cups of tea, Mortensen debacle unfold. Um, and my brother-in-law is on the board of an NGO that does work in Nepal. And we had these conversations about the degree to which the moment they try and get traditional funding for their humanitarian work, 
uh, all of the wrong uh, things start to get measured. That the groups that provide that kind of funding use models for success, which don't actually map or track to kind of on-the-ground success. And that seemed to really relate to what happened to um, Mortensen and the Three Cups of Tea um, project. I know it's not called Three Cups of Tea, but whatever, whatever that is. Do you worry a little that by getting those kind of funding sources, you're going, uh, you're going to have to start being accountable for numbers and ideas that don't actually come from your core sense of what needs to happen? I suppose that in some sense one could worry about that, but in fact, learning how to work and interface with existing institutions is both integral to success and also a huge learning experience. Um, you know, being, being able to demonstrate and articulate what you've learned from non-traditional experiences in such a way that someone who uh, is unfamiliar with the approach can understand is liberating and also uh, quite educational. I mean, ultimately, I don't want to, and the other thing is that having people challenge my ideas is a good thing. It makes my ideas clearer, but it also provides more of a perspective on how we can change the status quo. Because if we can come to understand what the mindset of conformists is, we can better understand how to articulate nonconformity in such a way that they can embrace it. Okay, so we're going to shift to Q&A here. Um, the two questions that I had captured in the chat I've brought up, but if I've missed one, and it's quite likely I have, I hope that you'll post it again. It's hard for me to follow the chat and the conversation, and I often miss something there. Or if you'd like to ask a question using the microphone, you can raise your hand which is clicking on that larger icon at the bottom of the participant window and uh, it has the hand with the green up arrow. Lisa asks, where can we find more about Rad Matter? Uh, you'll find out more about Rad Matter as soon as we have a product built and it's released to the public, hopefully by the end of May. And you're also working on a book, right? Correct which I promised my agent I would finish by the end of this month. And have, means I have a lot of writing to do in the next two days. You mean the number of words per minute has gone up? Minute has gone up. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. And here's, I put a link in the chat to your uh, manifesto. Well, I, I think yeah, it's called the, Your Guide to Academic Deviance on College Manifesto. Um, well worth looking at and, and very interesting. Uh, uh, I particularly loved so the last few pages where you talked about, um, hang on, I'll pull them up here. Uh, you talked about the uh, tool belt for life without college. So while we're waiting for other questions, and I'm going to check the chat again, do you want to talk a little bit about that tool belt? Sure. So the first thing that I outlined is that you have to have an elevator pitch. And this is something that's familiar to individuals who have been in the valley. But they're used to thinking about an elevator pitch for a company, not an individual. When you go to an event, or really when you talk to anybody, you need to be able to say, hi, I'm Dale, and I do X. My statement is, hi, I'm Dale. I'm leading a social movement called Uncollege, supporting self-directed higher education, or something to that effect. It's only useful to have a skillful command of the English language. It's far more convincing if you can articulate precisely why you're choosing an alternative to college rather than say, oh, college was boring, or some response that doesn't demonstrate your understanding of the issue. It's also important to have friends and supporters that are willing to help you along the way. Uncollege is not something that I could have done myself and have made some wonderful friends in the process 
who are, are still helping uh, propel the movement to success. Developing those support networks is something that takes time, but is actually far easier than you might expect. Uh, I recall when I was back at Hendricks, and there was, of course, the report called uh, by Richard Arm at NYU called uh, Academically Adrift that had come out. And I had just recently started Dunn College, and a friend walked up to me and asked if I'd heard the report about NPR or on NPR about academically adrift. And I said that, yeah, I just exchanged emails with Richard that morning. And the person looked at me incredulously and asked, how? And my response was, well, I Googled his name and opened his NYU faculty profile and sent him an email. So much of the barrier to success is ourselves. There's nothing stopping you from taking action and asking for help. And more often than not, individuals are more than willing to offer their assistance. So we've got a number of questions coming through the chat. Uh, Monica wanted to know, what do you think of sites like Behance or Wikipedia for sharing what you learn? Uh, I think Behance is great if you're uh, demonstrating knowledge from a, uh, a creative perspective. Uh, but as far as I know, doesn't have the capabilities to uh, incorporate knowledge from uh, life-wide experiences. I'm curious as to how you'd use Wikipedia to demonstrate your knowledge, because you aren't supposed to write your own Wikipedia page. Um, but do you have anything to add on that, Monica? I think maybe she, uh, I'll let her either raise her hand and take the mic or put it in the chat. But I would, the first thing that would occur to me is just by, by adding content, you're sort of showing that you're a participant in the building of the knowledge. Oh, right, yeah, okay, yeah. That, that, that makes perfect sense. And indeed, uh, as long as you have a way to, to show that and, you know, create a, a website that demonstrates that uh, showcases your contributions to Wikipedia, then that's absolutely a valid way to to showcase your talent. Um, Lisa wanted to follow up Lisa on Red Matter and wonder if there would be a cost for it. Uh, there will be no cost for users. And Brad wanted to know, based on your experience, what age do you recommend beginning unschooling? I started unschooling in sixth grade. Had I done it all over again, or if I were to have kids, which is very doubtful, I would probably send children to school until second or third grade. Um, I think there are valuable lessons to be learned, like how to follow directions, how to meet other people's deadlines, things like that. Um, when, you know, and as long as the joy of learning is preserved, there's absolutely no reason why, why those can't be learned in the classroom. You know, I certainly, I, I know individuals who went through all, and, and were unschooled all the way, and individuals who went all the way through high school and were went through public school all the way. And I feel like I came out in a better position than either of them because I have experience from, from both educational perspectives. But I would certainly uh, prefer having kids go to a, a Montessori or Waldorf or non-traditional type um, school where more emphasis is put on the love of learning than teaching to the test. Is it a fair question to ask why you said having kids would be doubtful? Because I think the world is overpopulated and don't want to add to the world population. Okay, so um, Jackie wanted to know, will your book propose anarchy against traditional college ed? I wouldn't call uncollege anarchy. Because I think that uncollege can and, in fact, should include some elements of structured learning. It's not about, 
you know, learning completely outside the system. College isn't going away, nor should it. There are some subjects that are, in fact, probably best learned in, in a structured learning environment. But it doesn't, you don't have to, to go to college. You know, learning is not limited to college. So Ed says, I'm a big fan of unschooling. I wonder, though, whether the term unschooling or uncollege draws people who associate college or schooling with education, which I think are most people, to think that you're about uneducation or unlearning. So I wonder why you chose that language rather than choosing a term that promotes the positives of the model, like self-directed learning, et cetera. I chose the name on a whim. Quite honestly, I didn't give the branding a lot of thought. But in retrospect, had I chosen something like learning infinitely every day or the knowledge life, explaining the concept to individuals who aren't familiar with educational terms, which is most people, would have been significantly harder. By using the term uncollege, people immediately know that it's something that has to do with not college. And it's easier to clarify what uncollege actually is when there's already the context set up than if I were to explain what self-directed learning is. When I use the term self-directed learning, people automatically assume that self-directed learning is solitary learning. There was a, a great article written at UCLA that about Uncollege, whose concluding line was, your bedroom is no comparison to the microcosm of UCLA. And I certainly agree with that line, but it's not what I'm advocating either. Okay, so we still have a few minutes. If you have a question for Dale, please put it in the chat. Again, if I've missed the question, uh, let me know. Um, or feel free to raise your hand using the hand with the green up arrow to take the microphone. Dale, who are your advisors and what role are they playing? Uh, Susan Walsh at the Gates Foundation uh, has uh, graciously served uh, in a bit of an advisory role. Um, and has been been there to to bounce ideas off of, um, and we've we've developed. Um, I guess I don't know. I've I I, I wouldn't say that that Uncollege is uh, quite as much of an organization as it's going to become quite yet, and my my personal mentors uh, have served more as an advisory role of the organization uh, than than the organization that has stopped. Um, one particular individual who comes to mind is Aaron Sullivan, who's been on uh, the future of higher ed and um, has done many great things and provides a great perspective about how, or provides a wonderful perspective on alternative pe pedagogies from a, a traditional education background. Um, and of course, as Uncollege continues to, to develop, there are literally people every day that, that I talk with who could be considered advisors. Everyone who sends me an email, I, I respond to, and their input is immensely valuable. So Lisa wants to know, why didn't you apply for Peter Thiel's program? And I don't know what that I program did. is. Uh, so Peter, Peter Thiel is the co-founder of PayPal and the first investor in Facebook and is sponsoring a program called 20 Under 20, which is giving out 20 $100,000 grants to individuals under 20 who want to change the world. Um, and I'm in fact a, a finalist for that program uh, and will hopefully know uh, if I've received, if I get a, a Thiel Fellowship uh, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so we have about three minutes left. Uh, Lisa's excited for you that you are a finalist. If you have a question for Dale, please feel free to raise your hand. Nobody's asked a question by microphone yet today, uh, or put it in the chat. Wally says, is unschooling a possible paradigm to reform the current system of public schooling? I don't 
don't know that unschooling is something that can be mandated in a public school system because as you brought up earlier, Steve, the minute you institutionalize uh, something and bring external interests into it, there are uh, alternative metrics and means that, that have to be met. Um, and I think in, in public school there are too many, too many interests that have to be satisfied. Because we're not just talking about the student, but we have the students and the teachers in the state and, and everybody who's vested in the system. And while I'm a huge fan of, of democratized public education, I think it should only be one part of education. You know, I'd, I'd love to see a public school system where students take, you know, one or two classes at a time and then slowly transition out of that school environment uh, into a place where they're actually directing their own education. Whether that can become the standard, I don't know. Good, and there's some good chat about this uh, in the chat there. Um, um, this week we learned that Joy Yito, I think I'm saying his name correctly, had been appointed the director of MIT Media Labs, uh, someone who didn't finish college. Uh, we have uh, Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, uh, others. Um, uh, do you feel as though you're getting a reception to these ideas uh, that's different because some of our business heroes now are beginning to be people who didn't have traditional um, college backgrounds? I think that's absolutely been the case. Um, and the connection, you know, particularly with some of the press that I've gotten to, to being a Teal finalist has, uh, has helped in that regard. Um, but I think it's also because more and more people are, are disenfranchised with the system. Students are graduating with higher and higher debt loads. 55% of Americans are, are unhappy with their jobs. And people are, are, are really beginning to question themselves whether leading a happy and productive life is in fact less important than uh, earning a salary higher than that of your neighbors. But I think the response, or I think that, that the level of response is indicative that there's a problem. Whether or not I have the solution is yet to be seen. But the beauty of unschooling and uncollege is that flexibility is built in. And in fact, as you move along, you have to adapt to the circumstances and the environment. Because if you don't, You'll be, left, you'll be left behind and will be in no better place than someone who is confined to a school environment. Well, that's a nice thoughtful note to end on. Dale, thanks so much for coming on tonight. Really appreciate it. I'm clapping for you here virtually. Um, this, is, this has been a really busy week for a lot of people with spring breaks or catching up from spring breaks and uh, had a nice audience here tonight to hear you. We are taking a short break next week because I'll be traveling, but then the week after we have a passion-based education, Hugh McGuire and Paul Kimmelman, and lots of other good sessions coming up. Thanks so much, Dale. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And if people have comments for me, please email my, my email is dale at uncollege.org. I will try and scroll through the comments and pick them out, but my brain is going a little crazy at the moment and email is the easiest way for me to keep track of things. So I hope to hear from you all. Thanks, Dale. Thanks for making yourself available. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about the future of education with Dale Stevens and his uh, movement, the Uncollege Movement. I appreciate that. We look forward to the book, Dale, and the Durad Matter and all the rest. Take care, everybody, and have a great night or day, depending on where you are. Thanks again, Stephen. Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>